Good morning. It's a pleasure to see everyone. Thank you, Bob, for, for getting us started today and for leading our Vision 2015 planning process. Bob was an extraordinary leader for healthcare in North Carolina and lived in that uh, partisan world of healthcare and now decided to jump into education, something that's far less partisan, far more mellow, right? <laughs> It's going to be a wild ride. Jim, delighted to be here at Red Hat. Red Hat's an extraordinary company, and you all have been just terrific in collaborating to prepare for today. As a leader in open source technologies, the company's uh, sort of metaphor about how it collaborates with other communities to build its knowledge and to refine its knowledge in a global sense is really a perfect metaphor for this work. Uh, our responsibility in collaborating with government and the private sector and important work like the community college system under Scott Rawls and the university system and others is we have to have that same commitment to transparency and collaboration. It absolutely has to be that. Um, so this planning process and our time today is in part a commitment to that uh, uh, transparency. So we're very, very excited to be here. Thanks to the panel over here. It's like American Idol. Here are the judges. Um, you're much more attractive than the American Idol judges. So if that's a good thing. And to our presenters over here, some of whom had flown uh, a great distance uh, to be with us today. So we're very, very uh, grateful for that. Uh, to those of you who are uh, in the audience and observing today, there are some opportunities for you to provide feedback to this process, a couple of them. Uh, first is there's the, twi tw the Twitter hashtag that you can follow on the screen up here beside me. You have an opportunity to provide some written input. And then there's going to be a link for you uh, to go online either during the meeting or later to provide additional feedback and observations. So again, we're looking for everybody's voice in this process, uh, not those who are just formally uh, engaged uh, in the presentations. Uh, by happenstance, the North Carolina E-Learning Commission, uh, a group that I happen to be fortunate to serve on, is also meeting today. And their meeting will pick up at the conclusion of this meeting here at Red Hat. There are other members of the commission who are here with us. And I would like to ask each of the members of the North Carolina E-Learning Commission to please stand and be recognized. Bob talked about the education sectors working together in North Carolina, and the e-learning commission is a critical part of that collaboration. And the infrastructure that they're building to align strategies with technology and the internet is really very inspiring, and it's giving our state a competitive edge uh, in this process. The commission is chaired by Lieutenant Governor Walter Dalton, who I think is out making an announcement somewhere else today. Uh, and it's co-chaired by two vice chairs, I should say, uh, Representative uh, Joe Tolson and Senator Richard Stevens, who will be uh, with us uh, later on today as well. And I wanted to make a special mention to them. Also, have to talk about with the eLearning Commission that uh, Joe Ferdoso, who is an important staff member of that commission, along with Myra Best, was recognized uh, in Washington last week as a champion of change. And Joe was recognized at the White House. Um, and we're all so proud of him and the attention that he's brought to North Carolina with the important work of the North Carolina Broadband Initiative. I know he's not here, but let's congratulate him anyway. <laughs> I really did not see you sitting there, Joe. And I really am, am really proud of you, man. <laughs> Um, so, uh, a brief word about the North Carolina New Schools Project before we uh, get started today in this conversation. The, the first is we were created in uh, 2003 with leaders in government and the private sector to initially, sort of the first phase, is to create proof points, if you will, of schools that can get markedly different results by being very nimble and focused on new levels of rigor um, and a commitment to graduating every student uh, ready for college and, and ready for a meaningful uh, career. And I have to say, we have two superintendents in the back of the room here, Frank Till with Cumberland County. Frank, raise your hand. And Dr. Spain with uh, Warren County. Welcome, gentlemen. The work in developing innovative schools is about a partnership with the leadership of local communities. It's really important to keep saying that because our role is to help them in their strategies to transform schools that really make a difference in those communities. So our first commitment was those schools. The second commitment is how do we collaborate with the state and local communities to begin to scale solutions in a way that affect all students in North Carolina and not just uh, some students. And there's not time today to talk about how that works but you've got some background material there in uh, uh, the print uh, uh, booklet that you got when you arrived. 
So we're partnered in the development of different types of schools. And some of those schools, and some of you are good friends of this organization, and this is repetition. Some of you are new to North Carolina. This might be uh, new information, but at least you should have this background. Some of these schools are early college high schools that are based on the campus of a two or four year institution with a commitment to graduating students uh, with their high school diploma and up to two years of college credit. Uh, and again, to set them on the path of success. Those schools in this state um, are really a success story of the commitment of the community college system. Again, thank you, Dr. Rawls and the University of North Carolina system. It's a terrific environment within which to work. Uh, some of the partner schools are focused on STEM education and areas that make sense for the new economy. Uh, other schools are more comprehensive and traditional schools that are trying to find their way to be more relevant and nimble in an economy that's fast restructuring uh, before all of our eyes. But all of the schools, regardless of where they're located and regardless of the context with its, which in which they serve and how they're developed, uh, are expected to make a commitment to 100% graduation, that every child realistically should be given the opportunity to graduate high school and be fully prepared for the next step uh, in their lives. As someone who's worked in middle schools and high schools, I can tell you that when I was working in schools, if you had in the faculty lounge said it's our commitment to every child that every child must graduate, you would have been laughed out of the room. That's how quickly things have changed. The North Carolina graduation rate, because of the hard work in local communities and by policymakers at the state level with the State Board of Education, thank you, Martez Hill, uh, is making incredible progress with its graduation rate, and it's something that doesn't really get celebrated in the popular media the way that it should. From our early beginnings, we recognized that technology was an important le lever for transformation. And we were fortunate to have partnerships like SAS and Caroline McCullen is with us today and the Friday Institute and Glenn Kleiman is over here, the Golden Leaf Foundation and many other organizations that helped us focus on the notion of deploying one-to-one -one technologies across a growing network of schools. Schools in which every teacher and every child has one or more digital devices that gives them the opportunity to approach their education in new and different and more meaningful ways than historically. We're very proud today that about a third of our partner schools are succeeding with a one-to-one -one environment, but we have a great deal of more work to do. So by the very nature of the kinds of schools we partner in developing, these schools tend to be fertile ground for experimentation and change and transformation. They tend to be far more nimble, and faculty members have a new and different perspective about their personal responsibility for the success of every student, their personal responsibility for connecting to their peers uh, to approach education in different ways. Some of these schools have developed creative solutions on their own. Schools, for example, where kids are using smartphones to uh, work on mathematics or another school that I was talking with yesterday where students text their teachers when problems emerge during the school day. Imagine that, being able to text your teacher and not being punished for having your cell phone in schools. Uh, schools that have replaced textbooks with tablets um, and are looking at different ways to use their resources uh, to access learning. So as you heard Jim say with his introductory comments, all of this is happening against a background globally where the uh, rules of the game have changed in a very, very quick period of time. And global organizations who are looking at education, especially in the sort of tier one uh, countries, talk a lot about the importance of educational innovation. Uh, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, for example, in a recent publication, became focused on how those countries that are seeking to align their education systems with the emerging economies have a significant lift within their societies to retask resources and leadership to be able to develop and sustain new and more relevant approaches to education. I saw in a, a quote in The Economist recently that I think sort of hit home about the nut of this, the thing that's really most important and most inspiring for people like us, and that is this. Uh, that the emphasis on teaching quality is the common, common feature in those countries leading the race for educational innovation. Let me say that again. The emphasis on teaching effectiveness and teaching quality is the common denominator in countries that are seek, seeking to accelerate progress in their schools to make them far, far more relevant. So at the North Carolina New Schools Project, we've spent our formative years partnered with others around the country, and many of you in this room, like Sam Houston over there by the exit, 
Um, uh, looking at and developing competitive models for school-based and classroom-based professional development for teachers and administrators. And the core of the work is rethinking um, how do we support teachers to help them be their very, very best. How do we create environments where talented, intelligent, and driven individuals are attracted to teach and supported uh, in that environment? And so we've looked at ways to network schools uh, across geographies in North Carolina so that a teacher working in Catawba and a teacher working in Chowan can share their resources and share their ideas, support one another, create that kind of synergy that's critical for them, for them to maybe overcome the expectations of their community uh, and have a support system for making the sort of stretch they must make if they're to be successful with every student. So as one example today for how we support those networks of teachers, we have been uh, polishing and refining and learning from a medical rounds model of teacher development that is essentially the model taken from the preparation of physicians and physicians in clinical practice who get supervision and feedback about their patient. Uh, that same sort of belief system and support system for teachers, again, to stretch, to grow, to be their very, very best. So, by scaling these models across schools and classrooms and communities, it's about finding more cost-effective solutions and supporting the hard work of the superintendents and their staffs that I just mentioned a few moments ago. It really is about collaboration and structures that support meaningful collaboration across a pretty vast geography. And I have to say, Joe, again, the work that MCNC has done with the broadband network puts us at a competitive advantage that other states simply do not have. It is a great foundation for strength. But the North Carolina New Schools Project, our competency is not technology. That is really just not our core strength. Uh, our really deep requirement in these uh, strategies is to figure out those collaborations that will help us grow and be successful and to take what we do extraordinarily well, and there are things that we are very competent at, and to grow those and to scale those uh, with our partners around uh, North Carolina. And so, as I conclude here, we're very proud of this early work uh, that has been developed, again, in partnership with so many others, a growing network of schools that have made a commitment to one-to-one -one that's being backed by their districts. We're proud to have launched one of the first networks of early college high schools in the country in communities that lack ready access to a college or university and students are engaging in their learning and their uh, connections to uh, uh, post-secondary education through virtual strategies. We're pleased to have created some blended models for professional development for teachers and administrators that are helping us provide more cost-effective and targeted supports for them. And we're pleased to be able to incubate a virtual community among teachers so that they can share resources and support one another, as I've just described uh, a few moments ago. So it's been really fun to make these sort of introductory comments. I um, have to, in the sake of full disclosure, say that uh, at the end of the day, all I know is control, alt, delete. <laughs> all I know is when it doesn't work, those are the three buttons that I can count on to get something done. In fact, at 6 a.m. this morning at my desk, I was very proud. I was a technologist, and I control, alt, deleted my computer. Um, so, uh, Jim, as we get going today, I want to again thank everyone for their commitment. This is so exciting. We look forward to learning from this conversation going forward. Thank you, Bob and Tony, for those comments. Uh, I think we're right on time, so let's uh, keep it that way and dive in. Our first two speakers, Glenn Kleiman, will speak first, followed by Monica Beglow. Glenn?